Welcome to the Three Knockdown Rule. Starring Mario Lopez and Steve Kim. Presented by Hustler Casino and UFC Fight Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule is in effect on the UFC Fight Pass. I am Steve Kim, joined by my co-host, Mario Bonsai Lopez, a very happy Dodger fan you are. We'll oh my gosh, I forgot later. about it. I was like, where's he going with the Bonsai? <laughs> That's right. Also, uh, shout out smoking Tim Frazier right here. And of course, we got Tino, Tino on the edits, the bout sheet for today. Obviously, we're going to talk about Haney Pro Gray and joining us via Zoom, our favorite guest, the Desert Storm, Tim Bradley for an extended segment. We got a lot to talk about, but before we get started, we want to let you guys know this podcast is sponsored by Hustler Casino, located just 15 minutes from downtown L.A. If you love poker, now is the time to play their High Limit Crystal Room for a $50,000 total giveaway this holiday season. Come check them out. Also, shout out to our sponsor, Scout Micro LA. They offer a unique and innovative hair loss solution for men. And they're, so they specialize in a thing known as SMP. It's hair restoration that replicates the exact shape and size of the hair follicle by tattooing tiny particles of pigment into the scalp, giving the illusion of hair. It looks incredible, especially if you rock a close hairstyle. You can see results in little as one treatment. They give the illusion of not only your close crop hairstyle, they conceal scars, camouflage burns, any skin, di skin condition you may have. Mm. They use the highest qualities, a lot of happy customers. So if you're going bald, if you're looking for a new look, call our friends over at Scout Micro LA. You mentioned this ad, and you get a free consult. If you're getting thin, they he'll help, help fill, fill you in. in. Round one. Okay, let's get started. From the Chase Center in San Francisco on the Zone pay-per-view and the new WBC Junior Welterweight Champion of the World. It was a dream. Devin Haney pitches a shutout, if not no-hitter, over Regis Progre. Mario, you know, we thought Progre had a puncher's chance. We thought he'd have some moments. We thought he'd come on strong. Can we just say it? we were wrong? None of that happened. I'm gutted for Progre. I thought he would put on more pressure, and, and it would have made a difference, but um, it, it really didn't. The five pounds... Made a huge difference for Haney. Um, it, it, not necessarily, I feel like he've got more power, but he looked like he had his legs under Yes. He looked very sturdy in there, obviously not killing himself. And he looked like the bigger man, too. He was sharp. He was <clears throat> accurate. He was not overwhelmed by the crowd. His father, I think, is a nice, solid foundation. Um, dollar Bill. Yeah, Dollar Bill, <laughs> who I sat next to watching the Teofimo Josh Taylor fight, and I kept looking over at reactions, too, thinking about that more on that later. But he was accurate. He 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 um, boxed beautifully. When he heard him in that third round, I said, oh, this this looks like it may not be Pro Gray's night. And then he, I believe, buzzed him again in the sixth. Yes. And... It was a tip of the hat for a beautiful, beautiful performance. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because as great as that was, and obviously he's a real player at, at 140 and a talented kid, I still think Loma beat him, in my humble mm -hmm. opinion. Right. Okay. And at the same time, this was the same pro gray who we thought we were, was going to look better and it still looked like he was struggling and had some heavy yeah. feet in the Zaria fight. So is it a combination of a guy who maybe had a little wear and tear, maybe isn't the world beater that he was in 2018, he is about to be 35, combined with he doesn't have to kill himself to make this weight in Haney, he was able to be a little sharper, because it's two straight fights where Pro Gray's looked like his legs aged. weren't exactly there, he looked a lot, he looked, he looked age, and... Devin Haney was obviously better than his previous performance, but I think it might have been a combination. Progray landed 36 punches the in whole 12 night. rounds. That's incredibly impressive on Haney's defensive part. He wasn't able to cut off the ring or catch up with him, and that's up there with one of the, the best fights as far as offensive execution. Haney, Teal versus Taylor was another one. Oh. Bud versus Spence was one. Inouye Fulton. Those are the ones off the top of my head were just, wow, it was just an offensive, beautiful display of art right there. And again, a tip of the hat to Haney. Pro Gray, maybe he just met a guy who was just at the peak of his powers at his moment. I don't know if we could write him off yet. I don't know if he's necessarily now just a gatekeeper. I don't want to say that, but you know, I will say this about Pro Gray. 
because he is one of my favorite guys out there, said it like it was at the end. Yes. He called it like it was, hey, you know what? He was a better man. That guy is a lot more impressive than I thought. He's such a class act. I think he could have a uh, maybe a future in broadcasting later if he chooses to. Yeah, you know, there's an old phrase, both can be true. Mm. Was Pro Gray a guy that may have gone backwards physically and passed his prime? Yes, but was Devin Haney spectacular and sensational? Absolutely. Both things are at play. And on this particular night, like you said, because he doesn't have to drain himself to that degree to make 140, I think he found his sweet spot. On this particular night, Devin Haney, uh, I called him Fred Astaire. That footwork was unbelievable, darting in and out, and the vision that he had. And if he was more aggressive offensively, you named some past performances of boxing mastery. If he would have been more offensively inclined in the pocket, that could have looked like Mayweather against Diego Corrales. It you really know, could have. The weight, I don't think I, I, people realize that I've never cut weight, and I used to cut weight all the time yeah. for wrestling and that. When you're able to not, even five pounds is huge. Of course it is. It makes the world a yeah. difference in your performance. This comes to mind, but when Victor Ortiz stopped cutting weight from 140 and went to 147, yeah. he had that great performance right. against Andre Berto. He was like another fighter. Remember how good he looked? And that, that was enough to get him that fight against uh, Mayweather. But he looked just so much stronger and so much sharper and just all around better fighter. And I liken that to Devin Haney right yeah, now. Yeah, by the way, when people say it's only three to five pounds, I say, right, um, it's not only three to five pounds when your body fat percentage right. is less than eight. Exactly. That's the difference. Of course, uh, huge difference. Um, We're not talking Tyson Fury losing three to five pounds. As far as I'm concerned, Devin Haney is one of the very best boxers in the world. If you look at his last seven fights, every single guy has, has been a world title holder. He's putting in some solid work. And I want to give him credit. And I don't. And I, I hear this all the time. Well, what does Devin Haney bring to the table? We don't want to fight him because of this, this, or that. This is a fact. He's sold out. In San Francisco, a major metropolitan city. Look, it wasn't the most exciting fight in the world, but it wasn't boring. It's a type of fight that at least a guy like me can appreciate and say, man, you are a skilled individual. I agree with that assessment. And by the way, on social media, he was trending. So I don't want to hear anybody else downplay him as a popular fighter. Is he Canelo? No, but I'm sick of hearing this. Well, the pay-per-view is not going to do well, and he's not a pay-per-view fighter. Mario, outside of a guy by the name of Saul Alvarez and maybe the heavyweights, nobody's a pay-per-view guy nowadays. So he is right in the mix with Tank Davis, Teofimo Lopez, Ryan Garcia. If you want to make a big fight, uh, the name Devin Haney is absolutely not out of place in that equation. I would actually favor him over all those guys you just mentioned except Teofimo Lopez. And right. I think that's still a very tough, um, close fight. Speaking of... so. It so again, to uh -oh. the hat, bravo yes. for, for the Haney camp. When you want to talk about entertaining fight, though, it always happens that way. Like there's, yeah. the, there's the marquee, big blockbuster fight that's supposed to happen, and then there's another little fight yeah. that's sort of... I, I can't remember the other fight at the moment at the top of my head. But man, the ESPN fights, boy, did they deliver. Oh, that was such an... For me, fight of the year, and what made it so dramatic is that it was such a huge upset. Talk about heart and resilience and drive and all coming <clears> together <throat> after being hurt. Oh my gosh, I don't know if we were supposed to segue to that fight so quickly, but man, what that just kind of made my night in watching that. As a matter of fact, I want to give it, my cousin, who is a loyal um, listener and viewer to this show, Alex Trazinha, I want to give him a, a quick shout out because even he goes, I can't wait for you and Kim to talk about this fight, bro. It was the best fight I've seen in years. We have all these uh, freaking guys out here having Twitter wars and putting on boring fights. These two guys put on a spectacular performance. Fight of the year for me, hands down. And that 12th round was like a scene out of Rocky. The way I sp um, uh, he went down in the fifth uh, and and uh, fell back on his knee, which made him stumble across the ring. I think most refs would have even stopped the fight at that point. Kudos to the ref for letting it continue. That kid was absolutely saved by the bell, no pun intended, but he composed himself and came back like a true champion. My dad and I were going nuts. You know, Mario, that fight kind of did remind me a little bit of Taylor Chavez in a sense that one guy was the slicker, quicker guy. You thought he had the lead, but again, it's like that drowning man who's 500 yards from shore and he's got to swim and all of a sudden the water starts getting into the lungs. <laughs> right, right, right. And he starts to doggy paddle. He right. starts to breaststroke. He starts to backstroke. And all of a sudden he's submerged. And you're thinking, hey, hold on, buddy. <laughs> hold on, buddy. You're almost there. And then he drowns. Exactly. And then you look at the scores. 113-113 and 114-112 and then 115-111. So the knockdown was the difference between it being a draw, where Robezi Ramirez retains the title, or 
and the new Rafael Espinosa. And we come back, we're going to talk to a man who had the best seat in the house. Tim Bradley from ESPN joins us more on the three knockdown rule on the UFC Fight Pass. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. $1.2 million. Oh. <laughs> and I'm losing in this fucking game. What the fuck? This is a 400k flip. If I win by way, you get 10 grand. Come to my fucking straddle! For my fans! What? Watch out. I twice. Wow. All in and a call. I'm not fucking leaving! Raise it up. And we're back on the three knockdown rule on UFC Fight Pass. And right now joining us, we, he's been very elusive. He's been like Kaiser Soze. He's kind of been avoiding us, but we got him cornered. Lippery. Uh, yeah, one of our favorite guests, Mark, the <laughs> Desert Storm, the Hall of Famer, Tim Bradley. Hey, Tim, welcome hey, back. Hey. Great to see you, too, I appreciate, man. Hey, I appreciate it. Hey, hey look, guys, I, I'm showing my face. You got a lot of fans out there saying that when I get, when I get my pick wrong, I don't like to show my face. Well, I'm making it. I'm making it a point to come on the show today, baby. No, man. I mean, you were at the Espinosa um, Ramirez War over in Pembroke Pines, man. Wow. You know, I always love when there's the highlight fight of the weekend or the fight that people have been talking about. Obviously, with the with the Haney uh, pro gray fight, and then there there seems to be like another card. There was another fight like that too. There was a highlight mm -hmm. fight, and then another card like just stole the show for me. This was Rocky all over again, fight of the year, candidate. It was so awesome on so many levels. How was it in person, Tim? I, dude, I was standing. I don't know if you saw some random pictures. Somebody took pictures of me standing up because I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing. Honestly, man, like it, it brought me back to the Provodnikov fight. Um, just seeing that kid with the guts and determination, the will to win. Uh, enduring whatever was coming in his way and still bouncing back, still fighting a way to win. I remember in the 10th round, I'm listening in on the corner and he's, they're saying, you got two more rounds. Like, and he was just like, just two more. And they're saying, yeah, like the kid had no clue what round it was. Yeah. You know, the kid was probably concussed from the fifth round. Right. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> you know, yeah, I did too. I did too. Honestly, right? <laughs> I did too. But he suffered an injury as well during the course of the fight. You oh know? my and, gosh. Yes, something ankle. I think it was either ankle injury or knee injury. When he fell down, when he got knocked down, supposedly he, he hurt. He hurt something. He tore something, and he was able to continue to fight, man. So it was a hell of a fight, man. Very entertaining, exciting. Right. But one, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it credit. I'm gonna give it credit where credit is due. The reason why it was a fight is because it was in a 16 by 16 ring, hmm. small ring. That helps. I'm telling all you promoters out there, if you want great a uh, great fights, and if these boxers are so damn good and think they're so skilled, it doesn't matter the size of the ring. Give us that 16 by 16, yeah. Yeah. and you're going to get action. Yeah, because if you need a football field, you just might be scampering and doing laps. But, Tim, here's the interesting thing about Rafa Espinosa. I remember watching footage of him early on when he was with another manager and he's a physical freak. He's the Sebastian Fundera of featherweight. Six one. Yeah. Six one. Yeah, for 126? Yeah. Like what? I mean, <laughs> Tim, do you think Robesi Ramirez and his team understood what they were getting into? I, I think they did. I, I really do. But see, you can never gauge a, a fighter that has very little experience. However, Rafael was a 10 year pro. You know, it didn't seem that, but he was a 10-year pro. Started boxing late. I think it was 14. Kid had like 11 amateur fights or something like that. But he learned along the way, similar to like Canelo Alvarez. You know, the fighters that come out of Mexico, 
you know, they don't always have an extensive amateur career. You know, they learn as, yeah. as a pro and they gather experience over time. So this kid is was kind of like often, often like, uh, you know, kind of like top secret over there, you know, 10 years invested. You know, he's been in gym, different gyms, competing, sparring against different top competition out there. And it showed because not only is he tall, you, you rarely ever see a tall guy be able to fight in the inside as well as yeah. You. So I was super surprised because I was like, I did watch him on tape and I knew he had an uppercut, but I didn't know he can handle himself that well on the inside the way he did against Robesio Ramirez. But to your point and to your question, his team, they understood what they were up against, but they didn't know that he was going to come with that type of determination, that type of firepower. Yeah, he trust me, your will. Trust me, you can't measure that. But when he hit him with that shot, trust me, I know him and his team, Ramirez and his team, felt that they were going to eventually land one of those shots again and it was going to be lights out. But the kid never went anywhere. Right. So it's really hard to gauge those those type of fights, this, these type of matchups where you're like, oh, man, you know, this kid hasn't fought anybody. Yes, he's knocking guys out, but he hasn't really ever fought anybody. And then you have the matchmaker on the other side saying, well, we have a two-time Olympic gold medalist. You know, he's on the up and he's on the up. He's knocking guys out. He should be, he should be able to find the recipe to knock this kid out. That's what right. made this fight, the fight so special and made it so cool is that not only was it an awesome fight, but it was also a huge upset. Yeah, and, you yes. know, it's going to be interesting to see how Robesio Ramirez rebounds from this because remember, he was highly touted Olympian, two-time gold medal winner, and then he lost his pro debut, and then he rebounded. Mm -hmm. But here's the difference. This fight took a physical toll. Tim, mm -hmm. are you worried that given his advanced age, given the relative lack of fights that he has, how do you think Robesio Ramirez can rebound from this physically and psychologically? Psychologically, I, I think it's going to be tough. I mean, this is this is second time. I mean, you know, the first first professional fight, and then he gets this surprise to have this hiccup along the way. I hear, I heard going into the fight, he, you know, he was going through some emotional things with family. His father was sick, so he had that weighing on him as well. Um, I think, you know, looking at the totality of the fight, I mean, it was a brutal fight. It, it really was, um, but. He should be able to bounce back, man, but you just don't know. You know, he has over 400 amateur fights, you know, a lot of wear and tear. I mean, I know he's like 30 years old, but again, there's a lot of miles on that dometer, man. Um, he has a lot to fight for. I would think that he will bounce back, but man, you just never know, especially after getting embarrassed like this, man. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to win this fight. They were setting up a fight with him in Inouye. Mm. So there, that that's basically it. So if Inouye was going to be... Uh, uh, Tapales, he beats Tapales, he moves up, and guess who he faces? He's going to face Ramirez. Right. Right? That's not happening anymore. And Pepper mm -hmm. Pines is near Miami. That, that, that was more of a Cuban crowd than right. it was Mexican. Uh, uh, before we move on from this card, I thought two prospects really shined him that we've been high on. I thought Xander Zayas is making progress and a guy that really opened my eyes, and I think he's going to be a featherweight contender by next year. Shoo Shoo, Bruce Carrington. Tim, your thoughts on those two young men? Well, first, Bruce Bruce, uh, he has everything. Ring IQ, speed, timing, uh, reflexes, um, very elusive in there. But, like, he's quiet, though. He's real quiet in there. Like, you know, it, it's like he's extremely selective with his punches, very defensive, knows how to operate inside that mid-range to in a pocket, you know, sees things. Almost like he has night goggles on in there, man. Sees punches coming, able to place shots in between. Um, a tremendous fighter and dedicated in the way he's going about his business to me is even more impressive. When I sit down and I speak with him and I talk to him, he says, um, Tim, I want to take my time. I want to do it the old way. You know, this kid is 20, 25 or 26 years old, or he will be 26. He's saying, I want to build my brand. You know, you don't hear kids now, nowadays, fighters nowadays, as young as him, talk about, I want to build my brand. They just want to get to the bag as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. He says, no, I want to get to the bag. Yes, I want to dominate. Yes, but hey, I want to be not a superstar. A superstar. That's what he wants to be. So I appreciate him, man. I love him. Uh, great fighter. And Xander Zayas on the other side. Let me just talk about Xander for a minute. This kid turned pro young, 17, yes. I think 16 years old, still in high school. Always had a good mind on him. Always good skill set as well. Well, he started to hone his skills and his mindset now, but his physical, his physical presence is starting to see. I'm starting to see it. You know, it's coming to the forefront. So he's getting stronger. You look at his body, it's built up. You know, he's looking physically strong. He's punching harder and he's getting the respect inside the ring where a few years ago, 
I wasn't sure if he was going to be that puncher type. You know, you, you yeah. know, you just never know. It's like, ah, uh, man, maybe he got to wait till he get his mind band bones. But another impressive kid, another sharp kid. And uh, but I think he's a little bit, I would say, a little bit more on the rush than a guy like uh, Carrington. Yeah, no, he's definitely getting into his man straight there. That was a hell of a card this uh, past week. Great weekend in all on, um, as far as uh, boxing. And on the other side, we had uh, Devin Haney, of course, with his win over region. Mm. Pro Gray. Uh, your thoughts on that fight before we start? Uh, well, well, people want to hear it. They, they want to hear it. I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm going to give it to you guys. Hey, I was wrong, too. I, I was wrong. wrong to I was wrong Gray. with you. I was wrong with you as well. Because okay, I'll tell you what, Tim. I thought, honestly, Regis had a bad day at the office this last time his mm -hmm. prior, right? And I thought, okay, maybe it was an off yeah. night. He's he's such a well-spoken kid. I really like Regis. And he just said, hey, you know, the pressure coming out and, and having all my hometown people there in New Orleans, and I'm, I'm going to be focused for this one. And there was a combination of that. He just had an off night, and he is the heavier-handed guy. And Haney, just seeing him get touched and and the way he reacted by guys who aren't as heavy-handed, like Jojo Diaz. and yeah. he, uh, a Linares and Lo coming off of the fight with Loma, which I still think Loma did enough to win. So do I. I wow, this is gonna maybe this is the night for Regis. Boy, were was I wrong? We all were. Yeah. We, we, we all, you know, it, it did matter that that weight that he was. It seemed like he. I don't know how much power he got in that pop, but he did look like he had his legs yes. underneath him, and he just looked really, really sharp and focused that night, like tip of the hat. Yeah. He was. Um, I could just tell you this. After watching that fight, when I was watching, I said, damn, it really didn't matter what what the hell Regis, what the game plan was, because he could have been moving forward. He could have been moving left, right, backwards. I mean, he needed a, he even if he had a homie in the ring there helping him trying to get corner freaking <laughs> Haney, he was not going to beat Haney that night. Right. You know, I mean, he was so superior and he was so sharp and so keenly focused throughout the course of the fight that Regis was never able to corner him. See, uh, the reason why I picked Regis was, one, I had a, I got a personal connection to Regis, first of all. Two, I felt that, like, because of what you just said, the Jojo Diaz, the, the Lomachenko, they were able to land significant punches on him with the left hand. And that's Regis' special, specialty is the left hand. Mm -hmm. So I, I was figuring, like, you know what? How long did it take these guys to close the distance? Well, it took uh, Lomachenko one round. Mm -hmm. He closed the distance toward the back end of the round. He was able to close there and get there and land some offense. Jojo Diaz, two and a half rounds. So I'm saying, okay, two and a half rounds. Well, shoot, it, should, it shouldn't take no longer than four rounds to be able to, for Regis to get to him. Both so much more never, and not heavy and not as heavy handed either. And he never did. And he exactly. never did. He never was able to close the distance. And he kept the fight in the center of the ring, which is Haney did. And I knew that if he kept the fight in the center of the ring, that he would be able to dominate Regis. I was just... Thinking to myself, well, if he can corner him and if he can land something, he can hurt him. And if he hurts him, he's going to finish him. And that's the reason why I picked Regis to win. I, I agree with you. And for the same reasons, um, that's where I was leaning. Is this, and not to d take anything away from Haney, because he did look uh, excellent that night. But is this a combination of both Haney having more of his legs under him, not cutting as, as much of his weight, and Regis maybe now approaching 35, having a little wear and tear and not being able to pull that trigger as quick now? Look, look, I, I know we keep talking. About, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about the wear and tear and the fact that he's 35 and this and that. Like, you got to understand that Regis started boxing at 17. So if he's 35, he's a young 35, in my mm -hmm. opinion. You know, that's not long. It's not like he had a long, extensive amateur career. Like some of these guys, they start when they're five years old. And when they get 35, of course, they're worn down. This kid started at 17, literally started boxing. You know, mm -hmm. and you have a guy like uh, um, a Haney that freaking turned pro at 17 years old. Right. So, you know, on that aspect, I, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm saying uh, he's a young 35. I think it was more a combination of both, though. I think it was the actual 140 moving up, having more, having more water in his system, you know, having, you know, uh, I, I would say uh, more nutrition. You know, he wasn't sucked up dry and you can see it. You know, you can see him physically strong in there. You can see him comfortable inside the ring, you know, at this weight class. And then he has some pop on his shots as well to go along with that. A little bit more power, good punch placement. You know, uh, he seemed to have slowed down the pace a little bit. He wasn't running. He was boxing. And he felt comfortable to be able to box from the outside and still control distance and not get hit with shots. So, And then 
a part of it is also is Regis progress. Slow feet, man. Gosh, I did not know his feet was that slow. I didn't realize that he didn't know how to cut off the ring. I mean, I saw it against um, I saw it against Zaria, but I would I would think that you would go back to the drawing board and be able to learn from your mistakes. But obviously, yeah, he didn't. You know, Tim, a couple of times it was really striking. The, the third round knockdown, you kind of said to yourself, uh-oh, this ain't going to be his night. And then throughout the night, his legs got weebled and wobbled. And I almost felt as though that if Haney shifted gears, he could have got the stoppage late. So, Tim, here's the question. We know the fights at 140 that we want to see. Tia Fimo, yeah. Ryan Garcia, Hank Davis, if he ever wants to fight one of his peers, uh, Subriel Matias. But does that version of Devin Haney that we see on Saturday – can anyone outpoint him over 12 rounds? <clears throat> when he's firing when he's firing on all cylinders like that, man, that's a difficult guy to beat. I mean, he is so technically savvy. He has good size. He has a long reach. He knows how to use it well. He has great feet, great reflexes, great ring IQ, uh, shows some newfound power. He's tough to deal with, man, for anybody. But again, I can say this, but at the same time, he still got to get in there and he had to fight these guys. Yes. So, I, you know, I, Matias, I agree. think about it. Matias, you know, pressure fighter, knows how to close the distance, knows how to close off the ring. You know, in order to beat Haney, you can't bow, box him. You have to take it to him. That's the only way. You got to keep his back on the ropes. That's the only way you dominate Haney. You're not going to outbox him. I would favor Haney personally over Garcia, over Tank. Yeah. Um, over Matias, because I think he's still too rough around yeah. the edges for him, but not over Teofimo. If the Teofimo that showed up, that fought Taylor, he's quick yeah. enough, athletic enough, and yeah. hit hard enough. Yes. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Tim? You, you know, I, I do agree with that assessment. I really do. I, I, I think Haney has the ability to outbox him, but Teo is just a different, he's a different specimen. He's a freak. Yeah. He's a freak athlete, man, with reflexes out of this world, man. And you know, he's explosive, he's extremely smart, and very creative. And once he gets relaxed in that ring, you know, it just something comes over him. I don't know. He just turns into some a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even have to think. He's dancing, moving, swerving, pulling back, uppercuts from odd yeah. angles. I mean, he's, he's un, you know, he, he's unpredictable. And that's hard to train for. Right. That's yeah, you hard know, to Tim, train for. Tim, you talk about that. I remember a couple of years ago, his dad showed me footage that he took on the secret. He wasn't supposed to take the sparring. He's a teenager against Udenis Ugas, really good welterweight. Yeah. And the stuff he was doing off the ropes, counter punching and swimming without getting wet and just pot sure. shotting him. And there was another uh, batch of footage he had where he was doing so much good stuff to Sean Porter that Kenny was cussing out his son in the corner in between rounds. Mm. This is, he's like 17. I'm like, whoa. And, and, and Junior's like, yo, bro, we do this to everybody, bro. Greatest <laughs> fight. I'm like, okay, okay, we get it. We get it. Your son's good. Um, guys, this is interesting. Chris Mannix is reporting, and I did get some confirmation from top rank. Speaking of Tio, they're talking about a fight with him and Subriel Matias. Whoa. Um, Puerto Rican Day Parade weekend, Tim. What wet that, that, well, that wet bot uh, indeed? What a fight that would be, Tim. How do you see what? that stacking up? Ah, uh, man, you know what? <laughs> I like Matias. I, I, I like him a lot, man. Um, that's a good one. I, I, I think that there's enough holes for Tio to be able to, ex to exploit against uh Matias. Um, but I can tell you this if he doesn't hurt him. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't hurt him and slow him down, he's going to be in his grill all night. And that could be a tough out for Tiffimo Lopez. But just saying, I mean, it's a great fight. I think I would slightly favor Teo, Teo, just because the athleticism and, and, and you know how cerebral he can be. But, man, I, I wouldn't count out uh, Matias. I'm telling you. You know what I love? You know what I love about that fight, though, Tim, is that he wants the smoke. Like the, yes. nobody wants to fight that fool. Yes. That is a dangerous individual. But the fact that you know what? Give him to me. He said, yeah. give him to me when nobody hey, wanted that. Yeah. He said, Taylor, give him to me. Nobody wanted that. He yeah. said, Chaos, give him to me. Nobody wanted that. Yeah. Bad, dude. You know, he wants that's it. A bad dude, man. And I feel if he's gonna fight him, 
fight him now. Yeah, yeah, but because if Matias can get better, and I almost feel like who's the tough, the tough brother he fought that he knocked him out with the second from Africa, the um oh, Kome. 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 I feel like a Kome, like a Kome. Sturdy guy, but he was able to boom. I feel like he's gotta get him now, and maybe we can see a Kome type. Because if not, and you let that dude get better, then he gets real dangerous. For as much pressure as Matias puts on, that style actually, when you're pitching fastballs down the middle, that could make Teal look and also keep this in mind. That would be Tiafimo, unless he fights in February, which Bob Aram said they're working on, and this fight would be in June. That would be about his fifth fight at 140, so he's grown into that. Yep. So yeah. I think that is certainly a factor. Tim, a couple of uh, months ago, or maybe about five, six weeks ago, you were in beautiful, opulent Saudi Arabia for Tyson Fury against Francis Ngannou, and I, I'm going to be honest about it. I thought this fight was a joke. I thought it'd go three rounds. How stunned were you by how much Tyson Fury struggled against a boxing novice? You know, I was stunned. But at the same time, part of me felt like he wasn't taking it seriously. Um, looking at the press conference uh, before the lead-up press conference, I saw uh, Tyson Fury. He was all, completely out of shape. You know, he did not look great at all. And he then, never does, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah. so My guy's built like, like a bag of milk. He it's never so, does. What I'm just saying, it's so hard to really judge him. You know, right. He looks or whatnot, but, you know, he comes into the fighter meeting, and he's just saying that, like, he's saying all the right things, and I'm like, okay, he did take this guy seriously. And then he gets in there, and the first round I see, I'm like, uh-oh. Fury's timing is on. <laughs> uh-oh. So, this is not going to be good. Right. I mean, I saw from the first round how uncomfortable – that Nganu made Fury look. He was uncomfortable. And I was just like, shit, this is embarrassing. <laughs> like, and then the, the fight goes on, he gets dropped. Yet alone, I had a dream that Fury got knocked out by a left hook. Oh, that damn. week. That I'm week. And I and I told and I told them during the fighter meetings, I said, Man, I had a dream that you got knocked out by a left hook by this guy. And he was just like, well, you better wake up and apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nightmare. Yeah. Not really. So, a damn. So when he got dropped by that left hook, I was like, oh, please, yeah. God, please don't, don't let this dream come true. He gets up, of course, Fury, he fights to the end. Personally, I mean, when I was watching, I was like, this shit is close. This fight is close. I went back. I watched the fight. I scored it, actually, uh, five rounds apiece. One round extra extra point. I gave it to okay. Ngannou. That's the way I scored it. Ooh. But the judges had it a different way. It's all good. But dang it, what a slap in the mouth, I believe, for boxing fans and just boxing enthusiasts. I, I can't believe. I mean, dude, that's, M that's an MMA guy, bro. You're the heavyweight champion of the world. You're not supposed to be struggling against an MMA guy. Bro, no. are you kidding me? Now you got all the MMA guys thinking that they can come into the boxing and take it over. Are you kidding me? Bro, disappointment, man. You talking about disappointment? That hurt me. It crushed nope. me. And I'm still pissed off at Fury for this. Because <laughs> he let down the whole sport. You're right, though. It yeah. made, made it look bad. Gave it, a, gave it a black eye right there. Obviously, he took him lightly and didn't train hard for it. But we're talking, you know, at, there's, so there's that. Then you got him yeah. who's like a physical specimen of a guy who took it very seriously, trained very hard. And it wasn't like he's never... Um, obviously he's never boxed someone at that, at that level, but it wasn't like he's never thrown a punch before. The guy was, was yeah. is, is a champion for, for a reason out there. And he's able to kind of mix it up with all that said though, does that now for me, it made it very intriguing for Fury Usyk. Cause it was like, yeah. Oh, is it a combination of maybe Fury is getting, uh, not taking this down? Well, yeah. Or is he like, going backwards physically? Or is he going backwards? Because, mm. you know, those are big, those are yeah. big dude. Those knees, are they going? I don't know. So now I'm very intrigued by the Usyk fight. Do you give Usyk a real chance or will Fury now be focused and better prepared? No, I, th I think Fury will be better focused, but I am worried it, the same reasons you are. I mean, <laughs> is he going Is he going to train? You know, the guy, guy's made a fortune, you know. Does, does he really want to win this fight now, you know? But Fury, I've noticed in Fury's career, he's 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 kind of ran away from like the smaller, you know, low center gravity, quick twitch type of fighters. You know, he doesn't really fight small. He likes to fight big heavyweights to where he can dominate and move yep. around them. Now yeah. he has a smaller guy in Usyk that knows how to fight in those scenes, man. Yeah, you know, like a, like a motorcycle. You know what I mean? Yeah. In traffic knows how to find them scenes, bro. And so I think it's going to be a tougher fighter than a uh, tougher fight than what Fury is expecting. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I'm going to go Tyson Fury, man. I, he always seems to figure it out. Uh, I think he'll be ready for this one, and he'll be sharp because 
he's coming off that Engano fight. Yeah, I mean, no one wants to be prisoner of the moment, but I thought this before. Um, Tim, we were there ringside when Otto Wallin, a smaller southpaw, yeah. now, already announced the Wilder rematch. And if you were there when he got cut, Mario, the tension in that building for the, for the first six rounds, people are saying, oh, my God. And, 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 and I really <laughs> think in other circumstances, they may have stopped that fight. Also, Steve Cunningham, a very good cruiserweight, but a cruiserweight nonetheless, came over the top, toppled Tyson Fury. His fight was on NBC. I remember the same day as uh, Canelo Alvarez, Austin Trout. I always thought Usyk, even before the Ngannou fight, as Tim noted, the darting in and out, fighting in the pocket, shooting from the mid range down the yep. middle. This fight was always tough. And that, and look, the two fights with him and Joshua, a yep. big guy, obviously right. uh, helping Usyk right. prepare for this fight as well. So no, I'm really uh, looking forward to that. Um, Tim Benavides mm -hmm. is that the guy to beat Canelo at 68? What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on the fight? Yeah, he's getting better. Um, I, I think Canelo, Canelo should have fought him a long time ago, and I and I and I say the same thing about like Terrence Crawford, you know, against Boots Ennis, you know, like you have to fight these guys sooner than later because what they're going to do, they're going to build confidence. One, they're going to get better, and you know, over time, they're going to hone their their skills again. And with that confidence comes along with that man, and they're hard to stop and hard to beat. So Benavidez, yes, he's a freight train coming for Canelo. Um, I don't know if Canelo's going to want that smoke, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, I'm hearing something about uh, him fighting against uh, Mungia next. Don't know how true that is. I know Mungia has a date with Ryder. That's if a that tough one, well too. For him, it is, that's, that, that ain't no gimme. <laughs> that's not a gimme. <laughs> no. it, it really isn't. But that I can see a big Mexican showdown between Mungia and Canelo Alvarez. And then hopefully we can see the Benavidez fight. But yeah, I, I think he has the goods. I slightly favor Canelo still to this day, slightly favor him. Um, I would say 49-51-ish uh, type. You know, I slightly favor him just because of his counterpunching ability and um, his punching power as well. Tim, that's exactly what I said just this last week. I slightly favor him because of the counterpunching, exactly what he said, uh, the heavy hands he can have, and that body's there for you. If yep. for some reason Benavides was fleet of foot and quick yep. with his feet, then it'd be a All different right. thing because because the B-ball kind of guy is the one no, but, guys, I, but Benavides yep. is right in front of you. He's got those fast hands, but Can Canelo's got that fast defensive movement and come back with those big bodies. You body know what you're talking right about, Mario. You yeah, know okay, what I'm no, no, but let me ask both of you this then. That's the assumption they fight next or within the year. What if they fought in 12 to 18 months? Don't the odds shift to the younger guy that's ascending in Benavides? I don't know if Benavides can continue to make 68 no, at that point. That's that's but let me, let me rewind a little bit because, Tim, you mentioned Terrence Crawford, who on the heels of his dismantling of um, Errol Sprints, he's been calling out Canelo. And a lot of people are kind of chiming yeah. for that fight. And I asked Tim last I, I, I was speaking with Tim last week. I go, man, what a drastic. Yeah. We got Terrence Crawford over here and he, who's obviously an inc incredible, incredible fighter, one of my favorite fighters. And then Benavides, totally different types. And both these guys vying to, to fight for Canelo. If you're Canelo, who are you taking? I, I mean, it, I got to imagine it makes more economical sense with Crawford, right? Does it? And it probably, I think the Crawford fight would definitely be big. I think Crawford is probably the biggest uh, American fighter right now, right along with Tank, right now, the most popular American fighter after what he did to Errol Spence. But I think the biggest fight that can be made for him is honestly uh, Benavides. Everybody wants to see that. The fight. Mexican, Mexican. Yeah, right. I just thought economically because I thought it might transcend, right? Because like, yeah. you look, if you want, if you want, if Canelo Alvarez wants the, the, the Mexicans, to believe in him. If he wants them to truly believe in him and say that he's the greatest fight Mexican fighter of all times, like he has to give them one of those memorable fights. And he hasn't yet. He hasn't given them given them. I think he can get one with Benavides. Yeah, I really do. Benavides would I, stamp him. There's no doubt. Even the last of the Mohicans that don't believe, they would believe. Now, Tim, you talk to Terrence. What do you when you guys discuss the probability, the possibility of a Canelo fight, do you say to him, you're crazy or yeah, there's a way to do this. I told him he was crazy. And he said, I agree I, with you. I, I, he just said, I said, dude, you're crazy. I was <laughs> like, the weight. He was just like, Tim, I, I got a secret. And I was just like, okay, all right, I'm going to let, I, I, I trust you. I got a secret, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, what's that secret? And he, he goes, he goes, I'm not going to tell you, but he was just like, I seen him up live. I've seen him live. 
and I know how to beat them. And I said, well, dude, I'm going to back you 100%. If you if that's the course you want to go, I'm going to back you 100%. So, dude, I love me Crawford, like I just yeah. said. And he's a dog, and he is a bad individual. You know how I feel about Crawford. But at the same time, there's weight classes for a reason. And I think about like when Billy Joe Saunders fought Canelo, homie broke his face. <laughs> or when um, uh, when Kel Brook went out to Golovkin. fight trip to fight Golovkin. He literally broke his orbital bone in his yeah. eye socket. And homie only went up like one weight class. Well, 13, 13 two, pounds. Two, okay, two weight seven class. To six. Okay, fine. But Cano so, Crawford would be going up even more. Right. So I, I yeah. just... I just think the power differential, dude, when you sit, when you see Ken, you see him in person, dude is just thick. And I've seen Crawford too in the dude, but, but he's a slight guy compared to Canelo. He's like a little Tyson. But I got something for you. I got something for you. So power has to have something to land on, right? Yeah. We just saw that. We just saw that. Regis Prograde can land, right? So Crawford, instead of catching punches, when he, if he faces Canelo, he's going to have to, get underneath punches. He can't let Canelo hit him with those big shots. And I think that's where he's going to go. If he was to fight Canelo, he will use his legs. You will see a different, more mobile, you know, you know, get in and out type of Crawford, making them pay, making them miss and making them pay with those big shots because Canelo to me is very predictable. You know, his feet are kind of slow. He kind of plots forward, plots forward, big left hook, big overhand, right? Digs down to the body. You, you know what to expect from him. If Crawford steps back, gets out of range, make that stuff miss, counterpunch, because when, who was it? It was the last guy Canelo fought. Um, um, dang, oh, Charlo. Charlo, Charlo. Charlo. So when Charlo was able to let his hands go, when he decided to let his hands go, he was landing. He was landing on Canelo, you know, with str good straight punches. But Charlo so, felt that one punch. I remember the second round, and I was like, that's it. But, and, Carl, but see, the difference is, <laughs> but the difference is, is that, that, uh, 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 Crawford, Crawford ain't no Crawford ain't no B I T C H. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. 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 I'm just saying. No, I know. I love me some Crawford. I just thought the weight was too much. That's yeah. all. And I, think, I just thought it was too much. And that's Mario, all, that's think, all I'm saying. I think Tim makes a great point. Charlo came to cash a check. Mm. Crawford is there to make history, and he's an unbelievable competitor. You talked about the term popular fighter. We're, you're the expert. What did you think of Ryan Garcia and his shoulder roll? <laughs> stupid. <laughs> you're stupid. <laughs> Hey, man. I feel that that was the Walmart version of the truck. That was the dollar ninety nine version of the show. Like swap meet. <laughs> man, look, man. I, you you usually see that. Like I I'm actually like I was just play fighting with my son today, and he turned his back just like that <laughs> with my son. Ain't never boxed before in his life, you know. And he did the same thing. Turned his back like this. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, that, no. You know, honestly, like. That's embedded. That's like deeply embedded into him. Like he's been doing that for some time now. Because I remember watching a video of him facing uh, Roley. He was sparring Roley. And he, yeah. he did the same exact thing in that sparring video with Roley, Romero. So, um, yeah, I wasn't impressed. But I, I will say this. I did see some adjustments being made. And I rarely ever see adjustments be made by, by this guy, this kid. I never really see it by Ryan. He made some adjustments. Yes, he used some footwork. He lured the guy in. He got, caught him with his signature left hook. Um, he did try to shoulder roll to try to slow down the pace a bit um, or the scary roll. Um, and he had a good jab for a minute. He had a good jab for a minute, just for a minute, where he was sticking outside. And then he had a nice little long guard or post type of jab you know, where he leaves it out there and he was able to maintain his distance. I thought that was pretty clever as well. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, I think it was a decent perform performance. He got it done. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing him against, uh, who who was it? Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him against Roley Romero. That's the fight I want to see. Garcia, Roley Romero. That's, that's, I think that's. Uh, It'd be one of those things where the press conference is probably better than the fight. And, and that sparring session you speak of, that's from about seven years ago at the Mayweather gym and it ended up ended up becoming Greco Roman wrestling and they yeah. had to break it up. And I'm just telling you, there's a real personal angle between those two. It's kind of a love triangle thing. I'm not going to say much. I want to see it too. I, I, I guess. <laughs> but again, this is the interesting thing. Um, Tim, the last time I saw you, I was about two rows behind you. You had your ringside perch right next to Joe Tessa to our good buddy. Yeah. Uh, Mario was blowing up my text messages because he was not happy with what he was seeing with Shakur Stevenson. And I right. told him, you know, we love you. You're our favorite guy. Tim, you're one of my favorite people. 
There's no way you could have enjoyed <laughs> Shakur Stevenson, Edwin De Los Santos. Come on, Tim. I know the position. Yeah, oh, I know the yeah. position. Before he answers, though, I know the position you're in. Where like, yeah. look, man, you got to sell this thing. You got to sell this oh, thing, and you still he, <laughs> he still got to do his job. No, I know, but like, no, I'm sure you felt a little bit of heat there. But hey, you can only call with what you're working with. And like, it's not giving you anything to work with. Look, 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 look. <laughs> I it, it was suspenseful for me. It was. I'm gonna be honest with you. It was suspensive, sp suspenseful to a degree, because Edwin was deadly. Yes. That night, everything he threw had heat on. Mm -hmm. Um and. Shakur knew he was smart enough to know that this is a kid that that would actually likes to punch with you. He will throw just to get you to throw or try to counter, and then he will throw with you. So Shakur felt it was extremely dangerous to exchange with this guy. He was like, "Hey, I gotta get get mine off, and then I gotta retreat because I know exactly what he wants me to do." So it was more of an IQ type of thing for Shakur Stevenson. Also, one more thing, I mean. You got to have some balls if you're going to be in this, in this ring, man. And, and I felt that like Shakur, that's one thing that he lacked that night, balls, you know, because you got to take chances. And that's the only way, that's the only way you're going to be exciting and people are going to want to see you fight is that I understand you don't want to get knocked out, but you got to take chances just so you can be entertaining. You can box, you can make guys miss, you can do all that stuff that you did. But you gotta take some risks in landing some offense, so that, so it can be so nobody won't be fucking just falling asleep watching you fight. You're exactly right, Tim. And the irony is that he lets those hands go on Twitter when he's talking <laughs> right there. But man, yeah. we, we got to bring that over to uh, or inside the ring. And I I've always liked Shakur. I think he's the most naturally gifted guy of these young fighters out there. I would favor him probably over a lot of these kids. Still a tough he, out. He's incredibly tough. He's like the Matrix in there. But you have to entertain. You said well, that you have to entertain. And if you want to be in the position where your pay-per-view fights, no one's going to want to well, pay to view that. That's the thing. It felt like a loss. And, and look, I'm with Tim. I think Edwin Dolos Santos is a legitimate top yeah, 10 no, lightweight. I actually guy. thought he brought more to the table than Frank Martin because of the power and the fact he's a southpaw. I agree. But Tim, doesn't it alarm you, though? Because as good as Shakur has been at times, when he's faced two pretty good offensive fighters that are heavy-handed, Nakatila, where Tim got off one of the great lines of all time, right before the 10th round ends, it's real quiet. And we're all just kind of, and Tim goes, oh, man, you got to get me a pillow for this. I'm about to fall asleep. And everybody, <laughs> I mean, Shakur got all pissed off. <laughs> me up, okay. And, real. and now this fight, are you a little bit concerned he does not like to handle power? And do we need to put him in a 16 by 16 ring next time? Look, I, I did say that. I did say that uh, this past weekend. I said, dang it. I know how to I know how to handle Shakur. Put him in a 16 by 16, you mm -hmm. know, uh, to make the fights more entertaining. But. I can tell you that, yes, you can say that. You can say that. And people have been saying that, that anytime he gets in there with someone with extreme punching power, that he becomes timid the way and, and fights the way he, you know, he fights. But some fighters, that's his mentality. You know, some fighters have the mentality of actually building on their work. So like Terrence Crawford, for instance, he's not going to stop until he knocks you the hell out. He will figure out a way to knock you out. He's going to keep coming. He's going to keep bringing the pressure. He's going to keep you know, uh, 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 doing the necessary things to keep make you uncomfortable, even though if he's winning every single round, he's still looking for the knockout. But then you have guys like Shakur that just looks to win. Hmm. He don't care how he wins. He just wants to win and he wants to take as less damage as possible. And his philosophy is hit and don't get hit. So that's the way he fights, guys. That's it. Some guys will be willing to step on the gas and give it to you and take chances. And some guys like Shakur, they're not willing to do that unless they feel safe. That's why some fighters are able to go to the next level when it comes to pay-per-view and marketing. Yep. Being a star the very next weekend, um, I believe, is when Benavides fought. Yes. And we showed that was a very... You want to watch him. Out, and you want to fight. And that, fighter. you laugh going, hey, I want to watch his next fight for sure. With all this said, uh, final question, uh, Tim, from us. Mm -hmm. uh, fighter of the year. Inouye, Crawford, Haney, Benavides. Who you got? If Inouye wins this this undisputed championship, it's hard to deny him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, 12, 12 months. Think about that. Twelve months. He comes. He beats Donaire. Then he goes up in weight, and then he faces Fulton, yeah. who was the guy at one twenty two in everybody's mm -hmm. eyes. And then he fights for the undisputed championship 
and he beats a guy like uh, Topolis. I mean, that's three fights in a, in a year time, two time undisputed. I mean, that's that's tough to deal with. I respect Crawford. I love Crawford to death. He's my guy. Um, what he did against Spence was remarkable. I mean, unreal. Um, but that's only one. You know, that's that's an undisputed championship. And you can argue and say that it was against a pound for pound number one. So there's an argument for Crawford. There's an argument for Inouye. For me, if Inouye dominates, dominates the way I think he's going to dominate against uh, Tabalas, he's going to get fighter yeah, here. Mario, Tim, I think it's hard to give that award if you fight one time. No, I, mean, I, no, I agree. Even if it is a super fight, I agree. No, I think it's hands down sort of Inouye. And I would put um, maybe Benavidez over... Good uh, year, yeah, Caleb Plant and Demetrius Andre. Really good year, and and great performances. Yes, they were very entertaining. That's the thing, and the only reason is because Haney had it not been so controversial yes. with Loma, because like I think we all yeah. agree. I don't know if I thought had Loma winning still that, had, but then he bounced back and looked really good. So the uh, this is the good Mount Rushmore yeah. of fight of the year. Uh, for sure. And one thing, when you were in Saudi Arabia, Showtime Extreme, I remember texting you some of the pictures. Um, they showed your fight with Kendall Holt, which was a unification yeah. in Montreal, of all people. And they do a not nice crowd. I want to say something about Tim. His first year after winning a world title in one year in 2009, he fought Kendall Holt, Nate Campbell, and then an undefeated Lamont Peterson. Mm. That's that's that to me forged. Fighters don't do that anymore. No, and nope. they, years like that before you get to a Pacquiao. And, and they were fun fights, never yeah. boring fights. No, and so yeah. I didn't remember, it, they were all fun. And fights. You know what I love about Tim, and I see this a lot. No, young fighters now get to the number one position, and if it's not a soft titleist, they wait. Tim, as soon as he got to number one, said, "You know what, Junior Witter, boy, he's hard. He he can make the Mona Lisa look ugly." He said, "Give me my passport. I'm going to England." He brought it home. Fighters are not expected to do that, and I think they're worse off for it. We'll talk about that some other time. Tim, one last question for me. I know that it is amazing to see your development, not just as a broadcaster, an announcer, or a boxing analyst. Tim, I love the fact you are now becoming a personality, and I know this, and you <laughs> embrace it, because you are becoming or have become a lightning rod. No matter what you say, the fans really care. They're either going to praise you or thrash you, and they're waiting to thrash you. I know the way it is. And even the younger fighters at the fighter meetings, they get into it with you because they don't like some of the stuff that your critiques. How have you been able to handle that? And do you embrace it at this point? At this point, I embrace it. I mean, I've, I've had too many run ins with, with, with fighters and I, and I know how to to take it. Uh, but, you know, what people need to realize is, is that I get paid for my opinion, um, whether you like my opinion or not. Uh, that's on you, how you perceive it it's on you um a lot i get a lot of fighters like after the show i just did um tiger tiger johnson coming over to me wanting to hear my assessment wanting to hear because they respect and they understand that i i understand and i watch the game closely so i i like x and o's i like skills like i can see it and so they want my my opinion right away even xander zayas who come over and is like hey what what give me my give me my assessment you know richard torres comes over hey give me my assessment you know, so, you know, there's guys that appreciate me and then there's guys that, you know, really don't care about me. And that's fine. Uh, it's just like with anything. But I look, I say what the hell I want to say. Ain't nobody going to stop me. Whether you come to me or not, I'm letting y'all know right now, fighters, you come up to me. I'm going to embarrass you, period. I, I will. I will definitely argue with you. I will take my time and argue with you and I will tear you down, you know, and and, and, and tell you about yourself because I've done this and I've done this too damn long. To listen, listen to you, and you ain't accomplished in the sport, Jack in the sport. So that's exactly that's right. A lot of a lot of these people, or maybe other broadcasters, can maybe uh, uh, fighters can have a beef with them, but you've done it. You know what? Tim so that's do? different. No. So it's different because you've been there. No. So you've been there, done that. So you, no matter what, whether you agree or not, you have to oh, respect. I got it. the solution, Tim. We we don't have to get angry. What you should do is that Hall of Fame plaque. Carry a, carry it with you. So if a guy comes up to you, you just pull it out. Get some Windex and say, hey, kid, shine this up for me. And when you get one of these, <laughs> then you can talk to me. But here's my Hall of Fame plaque. Exactly, exactly. I have one. You don't. Something like that, Tim. You just keep it modest. Though. Subtle. Subtle. Well, <laughs> be classy and, about and I want to say one more thing. I want to say one more thing. Like, people can sit up there and they can say that, you know, they say, Tim, you're biased. You're so biased. You're so biased. You're so biased. But they don't realize they're biased, too. Yes. Everyone's they're biased. biased. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're biased they're biased towards me they're biased towards the person that they're that they they think is going to win i mean everybody's biased in a way get what i'm yeah. saying sure so 
you know, they can say whatever they want to say or people can say whatever they want to say, you know, about boxing, about this or that. But I get paid to mm. talk about boxing and I've done it. So yeah. it's a different level. It's a yeah. different level here. When people say you're biased, that means I don't agree with you because I've never had this. Steve, man, I love that column. I agreed with everything you said, but you're biased. No, 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 no. It, it, see, it's always about, no, you don't agree with me. So we're, we, we all have our biases. That's absolutely correct. Yep. So people give you the bias claim. That means I said something you don't like. Of course, you don't agree with. All right. So Tim, and that's, fine. and that's fine. But see, I don't have a problem. See, I don't have a problem with people saying whatever they want to say about me. See, that's the difference. You know, these fighters, a lot of the fighters are extremely sensitive because they put in a, a massive amount of work, but they have all these yes men around them. And I'm not a yes man type of guy. I've never have been. So I, I'm going to tell you the real and I'm going to try to help you. And I'm going to assess you accordingly, whether you agree with me or not. Now, if, if you want to take it and learn, and I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you where right here. If you want to take it and learn, that's great. But you want to know you. I'm going to tell you something right now. You want to know how uh, uh, Espinosa beat Ramirez? You want to know how he beat him? He beat him by listening to my commentary. Ooh. They told me that. They told me that in the fighter meet, they said, we know how to beat them because you told us how to beat them in the, in the commentary. They watched the fights, they study it. And they said, damn it. We know how to beat them. And they said, uh, we got to bag him up. Oh, oh now said, when they have that rematch, Robezi is going to come into that fighter meeting saying, Tim, you're very biased. I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying, man, <laughs> if you listen, you'll learn. I don't know everything, but if you listen to what I'm saying, I, I know a little bit about boxing, baby. All right. Well, Tim, as always, have a great holiday. And Tim, you're always welcome here. Open door policy. Thank you for joining us. Hey, I appreciate y'all, man, for real. Good All to right. see you, my man. Take care. All right, buddy. No doubt, Mario. All right. That's the three knockdown rule. We'll be back with more on the UFC Fight Pass. All right. And we're back on the three knockdown rule. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our fine program, we still have some slots available. Uh, please reach out to us by emailing us at info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working with boxbid.io. Final flurries. Mari, how good is Tim Bradley? Oh, he I love Tom Bradley. He lets it go, I man. love Tim. And that's a tough transition to go from athlete to the broadcast booth. Not everybody can do that. He's uh, articulate, smart, obviously knows his stuff. And I love that he... Yeah. He's honest with his assessments and stuff. He's he's a good boy. Dude. You let him off the hook with that Shakur Stevenson call. You were outraged, and now you're now you. No, I was outraged by the fight. I know, but no, but I said I found no. I know his position though, because being whether it's entertainment or sports, whatever. Sometimes you got to call something and make it a little more exciting. You can't be like this sucks as the broadcaster because that that's not good for your the home viewer. Well, well there's, you know only, what I mean? there's only one Larry Merchant. There's yeah. only, I don't think well, he was the third man. Larry yeah, couldn't do that. And I don't call. think they will allow that anymore. And I believe after, <laughs> after Charles Barkley, there will never be an announcer that can be as blunt as he is. <laughs> Wait, yeah. when I mentioned that gray line, what is it? Let him come in free, charge him to leave. Well, that's my line. Is that that's your my line? line. But I thought they took that for Larry Merchant. No, no, that's my okay, line. Okay, well, that's a good line. That's and, my and line. Take so, it easy. Yeah, but Larry's actually <laughs> said after fights where they've had <laughs> mismatches, he said, quite frankly, tonight, we brought you junk. And there's, there's <laughs> one of my favorite Larry Merchant lines was during the rematch between Jose Luis Castillo and Floyd Mayweather. The fight was awfully boring, wasn't nearly as dramatic as the first fight. And Larry said something to the effect, um, well, they nearly had this fight in Las Vegas, or no, they nearly had this fight in New York or in L.A. And he goes, lucky for them, they didn't get it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Larry's great. Oh, I love Larry. So for Mario, for you as a sports fan, it's the best of times. It's the worst of times. So we'll get to it. But right now, your Doyers, Bones Eye, Shohei Otani, the money. I called that a while back. My sources were telling yeah. me none of my uh, buddies w would believe me. He's flying out to Toronto. Hold on a second. Shohei Otani, aside from being statistically the greatest player baseball has ever seen, 
outside of Babe Ruth, right? With his pitching and his hitting. And Babe Ruth never went up against any brothers or Latino players. Right. He only played like eight teams back and in the, the day. And the platoon system. Yeah, and that exactly. Stuff. No, but sure, he's really a special individual. And he just won the MVP So the plan again. is for him to pitch also. Not is for it? a year or so. What? Not for a year or so. But that's okay because his yeah. hitting is so, yeah. is so great. The thing about this astronomical number... LeBron James has only made like four hundred million. LeBron James is like the highest paid out for it. My guy is getting three hundred million more than the than the greatest basketball player. But they play twice as many games. They do, but he's only getting maybe what four at bats right now. But he has to play the field. There's no DH in the National I League. I know, though. so we stick him at first. But my point is, he's not he's not getting punched in the face here. That is a ridiculous number, and yet it's still justified because with marketing and right. stuff, they can still make that money back. I'm just thinking, are Dodger Dogs going to be like $25 now, dude? Oh. Think about it. A Michelada is going to be like what, 30 bucks? Like, it's they gotta make up for it somewhere. It's gonna be wild. It's already expensive as it is. Parking was like 50 bucks already. It's gonna be like 100 bucks well, now. Someone's gotta pay the guy. Dude, what all the rent. Rent. All the Mexicans are gonna be paying the rent, dude. They're gonna be paid out here. At yeah, it's gonna theater. look like J-Town out in the bleachers. <laughs> I mean, but here's, here's the thing. I remember growing up on our baseball team, a couple times a year, we'd go to a Dodger game, and you always got pavilion seats. And again, we are old, but I remember from 86 to about the early to mid 90s, pavilion seats went for about eight bucks. Yep. Maybe. I don't and, think that's the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. Um, we Mark, still need pitching, though. We still need pitching with all that So, so the first year, they're just going to rest his arm. That's yeah. interesting. Cause I thought, you have to. Yeah. Um, He's young, too. He's young. Now, is there pressure on Dave Roberts? Got to win it all now, right? Look, at the end of the day, it still comes down to pitching. It really does. I With Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, <clears throat> Shohei Otani now... My God, it, 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 it it's just going to be the biggest party in town, hot, hottest ticket uh, in the game. I'm going to be there still. I'm going to be there still checking it out. I can't wait. I think we've got a little less than three months for opening day. But at the end of the day, when it comes to the post, we were murdered because of our pitching. Julio Rios wilded yeah. out. Yeah. We, couldn't, we couldn't use that. Um, Bueller was still hurt. Uh, Clayton Kershaw was still a little long. The iron, wait a minute, arm wait, little, why don't? You rest Otani the whole regular season, and he's your late season arm. Oh, God, that would be seriously, great. What? Justin May got hurt, but I'm not even oh, finished. All our guys got, maybe, but we don't want to risk him when we, look, we got him for 10 yeah. years. So let's just wait. Hopefully we can squeeze a couple World Series out of this. But, man, we better at least make it out of that first round of that playoff. <laughs> this is Hideo Nomo Mania times 50. 50. Uh, exactly. I remember in 1995 what a big deal it was with that funky long delivery yeah. of his. Yeah. And that was a big deal. Then Chan Ho Park. Yeah. Th this dwarfs that was, it. That's right. Mario, I watched a lot of that Chargers Broncos game. It it's clear they've quit on Brandon Staley. Well, They're and, done. and Justin out. Herbert broke his th right. finger it's on his. Do, it's do over. You, let me ask you a question. If you're Spanos, do you fire him now? Do you wait till the end of the season? Uh, what I, do you do? It doesn't matter now. I would actually let him finish out the season. I think it's cheaper and, that and way. And you sit out right, Herbert, I, right? Herbert, you're done. You're it, hurt, it's you're done. done. I mean, yeah. That game, they could not pick up the blitz. And you know what's so fr frustrating, Kim? Is if you look at the AFC right now, which it's is mediocre usually... mediocre outside of you, Baltimore. Exactly. Yeah. You usually That's usually been the strongest conference the last couple of years. We got most of the games now at 6-6 six and six or yes. below. If the Chargers would have their shit together just a little bit, yeah. they could have still run away with this division. The Chiefs look like they're falling apart right now. You could have run away with this. It's so frustrating that they fall apart when the AFC seems to be just yeah. sort of lukewarm. Because all the heat's over the, at the NFC. Oh! Think about Denver. <laughs> they gave up 70 points in a National Football League game to Miami. They were 1-5. in five. But Sean Payton is a real coach. He's a real coach. Think about if Sean Payton was on the Chargers. I know! So that's why, in my view... The next guy the Spanos gets, and I, I know you hang out with them, and they're all in their big suite, and they call you. Get a real football coach, friend of mine. Yeah, none of them. <laughs> yeah, not a friend of San Diego, but anyway. But the, none of this, none of this analytics. Guys. That was on San Diego. Yeah, get a real. Well, I, I miss Qualcomm, but anyway, get a real football coach, real traditional football that likes to punt when they're at their own ten yard line. Does those things matter? All right. Anyway, yeah. we come back. Uh, by the way, uh, we didn't mention this. Um, this upcoming week. Really good unification about it, flyweight between Bam Rodriguez and oh, Sonny like Edwards. Oh, that's a good one. And Mario, uh, this is kind of a sad occasion for all boxing fans. The final Showtime card mm. featuring David Morrell, uh, Jose Valenzuela is going to take on Chris Colbert in a rematch, so it comes to an end. Do you think we will be able to announce the new deal at Amazon come next show? Um, 
No, it's already been announced. Okay, but we don't know the parameters. It's gonna but, start but in I'm March saying or... as far as a card. No. <laughs> no, like no, 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 not well, like who's fighting, but like, hey, we're gonna have a card February fifth or whatever. I don't think so. No, because I think no. it's the new year, and they got to figure out like mo- the majority the, of those cards are gonna be pay per view. So remember, they have to do Errol Spence Crawford. Mm-hmm. That is mm-hmm. contact. Steven Tracted. Espinosa's now over there. All right, and then you also have to do a Tank Davis fight. Now here's the thing, and again, I, this is not. I don't want to condemn anybody. But are you asking for a Tank Davis Pitbull rematch? No one is. No yeah. one is. I feel after this last weekend, the heat is really on Tank. Right. Because Haney has been really stepping it up, facing quality opposition. Right, and if opposition. Tio takes we've on got a Subriel Matias. Exactly. Yeah, we've got uh, Tio taking Matias. Come on, man. You're look at, It's now, you're looking bad. Right. So you're anyway, uh, uh, an end of an era, and I think of uh, the late, great Jay Larkin, who taught me so much about this mm-hmm. business. So, all right, when we come, the next week, we're going to talk all about the shows coming up, and we still have more boxing. We have the show in Saudi Arabia, and we have Bonsai, another Japanese guy. A new way. Wow, we still do have a little bit left. Like two weeks left of this yeah, year. We're, we're not wasting it any in. weekend no, this year. All right, so we, so that's it for this week. You keep on to come back. We ain't coming back, fool. <laughs> uh, three knockdown rule on behalf of Mario Lopez, smoking Tim Frazier, and Tino, Tino on the edits. Till next week. Goodbye, everybody.